Having a universal currency is the solution. The problem with that is, when you really look at it, the true power of a government is the power of the purse. People, if you ask them that, they'll say, what's their military? Yeah, but the real power is the power to print money and control money. And that's where the real power lies. Governments will let you kind of peck around that a little bit, but if you really start trying to change that dynamic totally, you're gonna to get major resistance because that's really the, the main power that they have. I've watched crypto very closely and I've, you know, I've followed it, and but I've always thought there's a natural friction point there that I don't know how that ultimately gets resolved. I mean, one way for it to get resolved would be for the governments themselves to move towards that, which I think, you know, maybe eventually sometime in the future they will. Today, we're talking to J.W. Ross. This is an awesome interview for so many reasons. I was excited about it because he makes a product that I'm really into called Feel Free. It's an interesting little beverage that has some energy component and also a kind of a relaxation component to it. But better than the product is the story of how he launched it and the elements that allowed it to go over 30 million inside of the first two years in business. Lots of good takeaways in this one. JW has a really interesting backdrop in business, but this particular product and its quick acceleration came down to a few simple things that you're gonna get to learn. One of them is how he got this massive retail presence really quickly. In addition to his online direct to consumer, which he's driving largely through influencer marketing. There are a whole bunch of tactical business operations things that you can put into practice today. So turn the volume up, focus in, take a bunch of notes. This one doesn't disappoint. JW Ross, I appreciate you coming to hang out, man. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So uh, we came to connect uh, kind of randomly, but it turns out that we have quite a bit of overlap because I have friends that have invested in your current company, uh, Botanic Tonics. And the uh, the namesake of that uh, right now, nope, that's the wrong word, but the only product you have right now and what I know you for is uh, Feel Free. That's correct, yes. Uh, which is a magical blue little bottle that is a combination of kava and kratom. Is that accurate? Yep, that's it right there. I love it. So I want to talk about the product, but before we get there, um, the I know tons of people that are raving fans of the product, but before we get there, why don't you give some background on your entrepreneurial journey and then bring us to kind of how you got into Feel Free Now? Uh, I guess as they say, it's a, a, a long, strange trip. Um, I actually I started out uh, in Texas and Dallas uh, in the oil and gas business. This would have been in the early 80s. Um, and I built up and sold three different oil and gas companies uh, here domestically. Uh, I then went to the Middle East and did another company that built and sold. Started out, didn't go to college, went right out of high school into the oil fields and the various lowest levels, um, worked my way up. And by the time I was in my late 20s, early 30s, you know, I had achieved what then I thought success was, you know, times a hundred, uh, you know, the, the cars, the planes, the big houses, all that stuff. My mentors growing up were, uh, the mindset was, you know, work hard, party even harder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, all throughout this period, my, as my success kept going up, my level of consumption of, of, uh, different substances kept going up too, and, and mainly, mainly alcohol. Um, and, um, that ended, um, uh, in, you know, kind of everything falling apart, um, off the treatment, uh, that would have been 12 years ago today. Um, so I hadn't had anything to drink since then, but I came out of treatment, uh, feeling that, you know, yeah, my life's better, but I'm not happy um, because I really, I've always been kind of socially uh, awkward or just didn't feel comfortable in social settings. And I needed that social lubrication to really, to feel complete or comfortable. And when I took that away, uh, it was, you know, again, a lot better life, but I wasn't, it wasn't the life that I wanted. So, I immediately went out in the market and looked for 
you know, euphorics, uh, tried all the legal stuff. I couldn't find any of that that really did anything. Um, and then I tried all the illegal stuff and most of that did way too much or did things <laughs> I didn't really want to do. I was looking for something that I could use, you know, on a daily basis to work out, drive a car, you know, work, be social, whatever. And I couldn't find it. At that point in time, I actually had got into uh, the fintech industry mm. and I'd launched a um, uh, financial technology company in, in Southeast Asia. I was living in Southeast Asia. And while I was there, I was introduced to Eastern medicine. And I'd always kind of dabbled around in it before, but I got deeper into it. And uh, was introduced to some plants that I wouldn't uh, hadn't been introduced to here, and I decided to start trying to experiment with different combinations of different plants. Did a lot of research around you know what um, plants have been used for social education around the world for the last you know three four thousand years, and um, started going around sourcing those uh, and trying them individually and then started trying combinations, set up a lab in my house. Um, I sold the FinTech business and it was kind of looking for the next thing to, you know, to do, you know, I had no idea it was going to wind up getting consumer packaged goods because I really was just trying to solve a problem for myself. <laughs> but when I was able to find the right combination, the right percentages, the right strains, I was, you know, using my friends and family as guinea pigs um, to try this stuff. And that's fun. You know, when I found the right one, there was general consensus that, you know, you need to sell this stuff. So I then launched off into um, consumer packaged goods. Okay. So, and I, I want to dig deep into this existing product and venture, but uh, let me back up a little bit because, and I also want to talk about sort of the, that, that journey of mm -hmm. work hard, play hard, we'll call it. Um, yeah. Because it's, it, it is something that not only a lot of people can relate to, but it is, as you mentioned, sort of taught as the path. So hard driving A type people get thrown into this work hard, play hard environment as if that is the right way to do things. So I want to talk about that. But before we do, can you just for frame, can you give us some context on what the fintech company was and sort of scale and scope? Because you, you mentioned, you know, having all the things. And I think it's really yeah. relevant when you're getting advice or hearing the journey from people to know kind of where they were. Um, what was the yeah. tech company and what was the uh, uh, what was that path like? So the oil and gas businesses, um, I think the largest one, I got up to about 150 million a year in revenue. So a pretty decent size enterprise with you know, five, 600 employees. Uh, the FinTech took about two years to develop the software. Um, I basically was trying to figure out a way to uh, solve the uh, remittance issue. Uh, you've got all these people around the world that are migrant labor that are sending money back home. It's about a half a trillion dollars a year. And the average cost to move that money is about 7%, uh, which is crazy. You know, Western Union would be the, the granddaddy of that space. And I was trying to figure out a way to take technology and cut that cost in half. And we actually did figure out a way to do it. Um, and we launched it and it was working well. Uh, it was an interesting story because we had two partners. One main partner was Oracle. It was in, in that venture and, um, they wound up, uh, making us an offer we couldn't refuse soon after launching it. And we sold it. My understanding was they were going to take it and expand it globally, and, but they basically took it and, uh, put it in a box. Mm. And we've not heard anything about it since. So <laughs> I guess so, it uh, it must have competed with something else they had going on, or they got some other longer term grand scheme with it or something. But it's been radio silent ever since. So that's an interesting uh, thing to have happen. How do you feel yeah. about that? Do you have any emotional charge to that? Some because some people that happens to and they take the money and they're like. Yeah, fuck it. I got paid. I'm done. And some people you know, are so committed to the outcome that they have a different response. Yeah, it was a nice payday, so I'm not going to complain about it at all. Um, you know, I really, from a personal standpoint, I was really trying to do something I felt like needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And I like, I would like to have seen that to the end. 
Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I realized when I got into it was this global banking system is extremely complex. Uh, It's very political. It takes a tremendous amount of money to break into that. And I, you know, even though we launched in one area, it was working, I could, I could see the writing on the wall that unless I could convince the right banking partners to cooperate, that I was going to get just shut out. So, uh, my thought was you could take, you know, the Oracle or something like that could take it and really, you know, have the muscle to do what needed to be done. But, um, that had materialized. That's, you know, that's kind of, um, Oh, it's kind of saddening that, you know, <laughs> that that's what happened. But I think if I hadn't done that, it probably wouldn't have happened anyway. And I wouldn't have, I would have lost the capital that we had invested in. It. So, uh, and what I year think was we, that or what years? Know, that was in, um, it was in like 2000 in 16. Yeah. Late 2016. Yeah. And so for, uh, you know, fintech payments are my world, right? I spend a really disturbingly disproportionate amount of my time on, <laughs> on thinking about payments. Uh, oh, okay. that's, yeah. So easy pay direct is a credit card processing company, ACH company. Uh, and okay. we specifically focus on e-commerce and difficult to solve payment problems. Um, but cross border isn't our area of expertise. And for, um, those that, aren't in that space, they don't even think about it, right? It's just like, oh yeah, Cross send order money. is is very complex because of the different currencies. Mm-hmm. You know, most people think that, you know, if I send money, if I wire money from here to say Hanoi, Vietnam, that my bank sends that to the bank in Hanoi. That's not how it works. It goes it can go through it will go through at least one other bank and sometimes even more than that, hop skipping along. Everybody along the way gets their cut. Everybody along the way plays the float. And it can be, you know, it's just a, it's a very uh, complex system. It and, is. And because and a of question that, of, there's a question of how that currency converts also. And who does exactly. that? And if it's and a static conversion or dynamic yeah. or, uh-huh. Yeah. Everybody's, you know, trying to make, you know, as much as they can here and there. And, and because of that, you know, is why Western Union has been able to dominate that space for so long with, you know, a very old antiquated system uh, that is extremely expensive. But, you know, it's the best thing that's, that's you know, that's, there, there are some other things that come out like TransferWise and some other companies that, have, that are nibbling into that space. But uh, there's no one yet that I know of that's really figured out how to really fix that or to advance that well, on, on global scale. Yeah, we are uh, we are in a weird moment for this to be the subject matter, uh, given the current um, ecosystem in November of 2022. But, you know, crypto is the promise to fix that. Yeah. And as it turns out, 90 percent of crypto transactions happen outside of the U.S. And that is part of the reason is that it's an easier way to move funds from one place to another. Having a universal currency is is the solution. The, the problem with that is that my experience or my thought, opinion, whatever you want to say it is, is that when you really look at it, the, the true power of a government is the power of the purse. You know, people, if you ask them that, they'll say, what's their military? Yeah, but the real power is the power to print money and control money. I mean, that's where the real power lies. So, you know, governments will let you kind of peck around that a little bit. But if you really start trying to change that dynamic totally, you're going to get major resistance because, you know, that's really the, the main power that they have. I've watched crypto very closely and I've, you know, I've followed it and that I've always thought, you know, that there's a natural friction point there that I don't know how that ultimately gets resolved. Um, I mean, one way for it to get resolved would be for the governments themselves to move towards that, uh, which I think, you know, maybe eventually sometime in the future they will. Yeah, right. They're, they're trying. The problem is it doesn't solve what you're talking about, which is that it's not yeah. just you know, it's not just the, um, the smoothness of the transactions here. It's actually 
each independent government wants all of the power. (laughs) And so, you know, standardizing it doesn't solve the problem for the actual government power issue. Exactly. It's a very, very complex issue that, uh, unfortunately, the people that get hurt the most with this are the ones that, that can least afford it. I mean, I guess it pains me to see, you know, an example would be workers in, in uh, the Middle East. They'll pay 20% of their paycheck to get money back to India. And it's just, that's just crazy in, in today's time and technology. That it you know, it'd take a week to get the money there. So that's what I was trying to to work on, and and uh, I guess at the end of the day, I guess I could say that was a failure. I mean, from economic standpoint, to me personally, it was you know I came out okay, but you know I didn't accomplish what I was after. But and you know I said that long strange trip. If it hadn't been for doing that, I wouldn't have been in Southeast Asia. <laughs> And I wouldn't have come across these other plants and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, which is from all appearance, it's going to be way more successful than anything I've ever done in my life. Interesting. Uh, so, OK, oil and gas, taxes, mm-hmm. uh, yep. fintech in Asia. Yep. Uh, and now uh, I just refer to it as the magical blue bottle very often. Um, but <laughs> tell me about the financial structure. Did you, I, I know that you brought on investment, um, but what, what were the numbers like and how did you think about launching this product? Because you had been through a couple cycles, right? You had built the mm-hmm. $150 million oil and gas thing with several hundred employees. You started the FinTech company and was that also, uh, was that a funded, um, venture or did you bootstrap it? How did you approach that? Private capital, part of it, mine, part of it, you know, just a small group of uh, individuals. Uh, and that company actually got, I mean, at the height, we were at 700 employees uh, in, oh. in Southeast Asia. I mean, it, it was growing very rapidly. Revenue-wise, it wasn't uh, wasn't as much as some of the oil and gas. We were, satis- we were servicing a market that needed to be serviced, and it would have scaled pretty quickly if we hadn't sold out. Uh, and then when you moved to um, Feel Free... What, Mm -hmm. how did you think about launching that? And what was the, you know, the financial structure of that and go to market for that? Very similar to when I moved from oil and gas to FinTech, I knew nothing. I mean, up until that point, my my experience with consumer packaged goods was going to the store and buying them. So I had to start from scratch and, you know, and learn the industry. And um, fortunately, there's a lot of things in that industry. What I've noticed over, now being in three different industries is that there's a lot of things that that apply across the board and in fact there's some specific things that you can take as an outsider and use that you know that the supposed those in the know wouldn't think of using mm-hmm. and i've always tried to kind of build and stack on that with each with each business and i feel like for this business a lot of the mistakes that i made in the prior industries I was able to to not have to go through that time and expense because I'd already made those mistakes. I'd already paid for that learning curve. Can you give me an example of some of the transferable things? Because CPG is one of these industries that (laughs) almost across the board, people that are involved in CPG uh, and the in its periphery will tell you that it's one of the more challenging industries to try to execute. It's extremely challenging, Ma- mainly the distribution. The distribution is is really hard to break into, especially with a new product. You know, I think we're an example of that you, you asked. When we did oil and gas, I totally vertically integrated. Them. We did, we had our own service company, we had the rigs, we had production company we had pipelines we had you know we did everything because what i figured out as a a smaller entity when starting was that yeah you could make a lot of money but you wouldn't i mean you could you could you could generate a lot of revenue but you wouldn't make anything because all these people along the way were you know fingers in the pie they were taking things out all kinds of shenanigans you know and they they were had been doing it a long time so they were really uh, good at figuring out how to uh, extract, you know, every dime out of you. <laughs> I learned those lessons the hard way. And this one, from the very beginning, we vertically integrated. 
And in doing that, we saved a tremendous amount of time and expense. Uh, I mean, to give you a, an idea, I mean, we launched this company in May of 2020. Wow. Um, and it did um, like two and a half million in revenue in, in um, 21. It's going to do, it's going to probably end the year about 32 million this year. Wow. And at the rate that it's going, I mean, it'll be at over a hundred million run rate by third quarter next year. Wild. And the margins are, are great. And we built this, uh, we've raised about 16 million in capital and spent about nine of that. Uh, and the company's uh, very close to being profitable. Okay. I have a thousand questions about this. Um, but when you, so the, the, the big, the, the big takeaway there from a transferable skills was that the vertical integration, most people in CPG don't even consider that being a proposition because it's difficult because it's like you have several different little businesses that you're running to make the one product work. And right now it's disparate enough, uh, for most companies, uh, that it makes it accessible, right? So you can have somebody produce, um, the product. And then you can have them drop ship it if you want, right? Um, co-packing. Can you talk about the different elements of that and sort of the um, why you decided to approach it that way? Because that certainly has got to be a more complex, more expensive way to start the company. It is, you know, and you, you have to take that leap of faith that you know. And we did for a very short period. We used a co-packer in the beginning, um, but you know what I figured out very quickly with co-packers that were kind of like same thing in the oil and gas businesses. They're very efficient. I mean, their their motive is to produce the product as fast as they can and, you know, get you out the door. Uh, not really looking so much at quality, but just produce units as fast as possible, as low a cost as possible and charge you as much as they can. Uh, that's not really what you want. Uh, what you want more than anything is a good quality product. And, you know, when you're starting something too, there's a lot of adjustments that have to be made, you know, on the fly. And it's really hard to do that in a co-packer again, because they don't want to, they don't want to do that. That slows them down. So, um, so you got the co-packer part and then you have the, uh, the distribution part and the distribution, you know, you've got a lot of small distribution companies and then you have the, you know, the big ones like UNFI and KE and those. And, uh, if you're a new small product, there's no way to make money. I mean, they're going to extract more money out of you than what you're going to make. I don't care who you are. And then when you get up into being with the big distributors, unless you're moving huge, huge volumes, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to, they have the upper hand on you and they're going to extract, you know, everything they can get out of you. Can, can we pull that apart a little bit? Because I don't fully get the distribution concept, uh, in entirety. So I think about CPG in terms of most people are looking at distribution through retail or they're going mm -hmm. direct to consumer. Um, and that's kind of where my head goes with the two. When you reference distribution, is that what you're talking about? Uh, the piece I was just talking about would be retail distribution. When I say retail distribution, a company that you know gets you into the stores and services those stores. Most CPG companies don't have their own distribution. They use, you know, third party distribution companies and it works great once you get to be a certain size, mm. but until you get to that size, they, they beat the hell out of you. Mm. Um, and then on the other side of it, the direct to consumer part you're talking about, they, most companies use third party fulfillment centers to do the fulfillment until they get to a point where they can, you know, bring it in the house. And some of them don't even do it then. They just don't want to get into that. But there again, it's, you know, it's not their product. And they, you know, they're just concerned about getting in the box, getting it out the door. They don't care, you know, if it breaks or whatever. You know, it's, it's just a, it's really hard to maintain a, a very high level of, you know, customer service using third parties. Yeah, that makes sense. I would also think that it would be difficult from a, uh, retail distribution perspective to adequately uh, 
I, I would think that the incentives would be different for a distributor going into a store and saying, hey, we really have to push more feel free in the store versus if you had an in-house salesperson. What is the overlap between those things and how does that work? So, yeah, I mean, a distributor is going to be carrying, you know, dozens of products normally. Right. And they're going to have two or three that's their, you know, the star players. And that's where they're going to focus their effort. Everything else is just going to kind of be on the truck. And the store is really going to have to ask for it to get, you know, to get mm -hmm. much play. And, and most distributors too, when they bring it to the store, that's literally all they do. They drop it in the back and then they expect the store to merchandise it and all that, get it on the shelves, make sure that the marketing's up and all that. And, that normally doesn't happen. It either doesn't happen at all. It sits in the back for, for smaller products or it doesn't happen right. And then you have this thing of, you know, most people don't realize that, you know, the stores are very, that real estate inside the stores is very competitive. It makes a lot of difference on success or failure, depending on where you're placed in the store. Pepsi did an incredible study uh, four or five years ago, long-term study on full-size grocery stores. And what they found out was that 80% of the business happens around the outside ring of the store. And you'll notice that outside ring is, is produce and, and cool sections and all that. Very seldom, you know, most of the traffic doesn't go into the aisles unless they're specifically going in to get something. Uh, so if you put a new product on an aisle on the inside of a grocery store, it is not, go I don't care how great it is, it's not going to sell because nobody sees it. <laughs> um, and then after reading that, I even, I even noticed myself when I go to the grocery store, that's what I do. I ring around the outside and there's a lot of factors going on. People perceive that as being fresher because it's cold. In a lot of cases, they're putting products on there in those cool sections that are actually shelf stable. Mm. And they're putting them in there because they know that people think that they're fresher if they're kept cold. Even though Crazy. they they could fit, you know, on an aisle inside, uh, so that's a very competitive space out around the perimeter of the store. Even more competitive is the impulse section, and that's at the counter. That's at the counter, or you know, or going right to the counter. That's where the real volume moves. Because uh, a lot of times, it's someone I've caught myself doing this. You're standing there waiting to get checked out, and you look at something, you're like, oh, okay, and you grab that. You didn't go in there for that, <laughs> but it looks good. You know, it's sitting right there and you're, you're, you know, you're trying to kill time. And you grab it and you try it. Ooh, I like that. Now you're a regular customer. So that, you know, and I, I would say that the, the company that really mastered that or figured it out first was five hour energy. Mm. Five hour energy built their business, which, you know, it, at, at the highlight was a billion a year of revenue. It's back down now to about 180, but um, you know, they mastered putting a little rack right by the register and you know, they owned that space. And that was the, you know, they firmly that was their business plan. Yeah, that's interesting. And the other thing that I that I always found fascinating about five hour energy, and actually Red Bull also they're very different, but they also broke into a totally new form factor for an already existing concept, right? So which was caffeine, yes. right? So Red yes. Bull had this unique tiny can that nobody else had at the time. And then Five Hour Energy said, forget the can altogether. Here's a shot that you can get. Yeah, Five Hour Energy actually was the very first one. Uh, and, you know, they came in that little shot, very convenient, very easy to travel with. They got the impulse section, you know, and they made a, you know, they made a home run. And then after that, uh, you have Red Bull, Monster, all these guys coming in with a, you know, more of a drink version of it in the cooler. Uh, and that's really what's happened to Five Hour is they've lost market share to those guys. How much of, and so for anybody that hasn't had Feel Free yet, uh, <laughs> Uh, you are a tiny blue bottle, which is what, two and a half, three ounces, something like that. Two, two ounces, yes. Two ounces. And how much of your decision to put it in that had to do specifically with being a unique form factor, if any? There was a lot of factors that went into that. You know, I, by then I had really, 
studied the business or the industry very, you know, and I learned a lot quickly. Um, I learned that you damn sure don't want to be cold chain uh, because it costs so much more to, to distribute. You have a much higher loss factor due to spoilage. You really don't want to be shipping water around um, and because it's expensive, it takes up a lot of space. So if you can concentrate something, you know, in a small format, make it shelf stable, like Five Hour did, that's where the biggest margins are. There's so many different things along the chain that makes it so much easier to make that work versus anything in a large format. And also in the convenience stores, it's very limited space. I mean, what the convenience store, their model is, is how much money am I making per square inch? That's the way that they're looking at, you know, the real estate. And they're going to be moving things around based off of, you know, the velocities. And if you have something that's, you know, the size of a two ounce bottle that's making a 47% margin and is flying out the door, you're going to be, that's going to be sitting right there in front of the cash register because they know that's the best. That's like the Park Avenue of, of a convenience store. That's super interesting. I knew, I mean, I've always, uh, for a long time, understood the concept of the impulse buy at the checkout, right? You're just standing there <laughs> looking at the things teasing you that you might want to buy. Um, yeah. But I haven't thought about the metric of sort of um, profitability per inch in a convenience store, which yeah. makes total sense if you have a very confined, you know, call it 700 to 3,000 square foot store. Right. And most people don't realize that convenience is the largest channel in the country. There's 154,000 convenience stores and they move tremendous volume. Here's a question for you. So it occurred to me recently, I've been to probably three convenience stores in the last three years. And the reason for that is that I stopped buying gas. Do you think that convenience stores are going to shift from a retail perspective uh, to not being the most dominant player, how do you see that impacting it? I think it, it's it's demographic. You haven't, and I haven't that much, but there's a lot of people that that's, it's not really gasoline that they're getting when they're going in there. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, um, construction workers. Mm. Um, they're stopping there in the morning. They're getting, you know, something for breakfast. They're getting a coffee or an energy drink or whatever. And, you know, they're probably coming back in some cases at noon at the end of the day, too. They're, they're there multiple times a day. They're li usually there at least twice in the morning and, and evening. That's driving, you know, a big, big part of the business. And, you know, you see that in what the, the main things that sell in convenience stores are tobacco and alcohol. Mm. So they're coming in the morning. They're getting, you know, uh, Cigarettes, that type of stuff. They're coming back, you know, at the end of the day, they're grabbing a six pack or 12 pack or whatever, you know, on the way home. The energy drinks, the tobacco, the alcohol, those are what are the big drivers at convenience stores. Yeah, that makes sense. I suppose, you know, my gas was the excuse. So I happened to be there yeah. more often because yeah. of it. But I certainly also, in my uh, youth, I was a landscaper for a period of time and for sure. Um, the convenience stores were the quick stop to get whatever yeah. on the path to the next next spot. I think especially now, you know, most of the gas is self-serve and you just, you know, you pull up, you fill your car up and you don't ever even go into the store. I know, I know that I, that's, you know, my experience anyway. So, uh, but fortunately, there's this whole other demographic that's going out on a regular basis. All the time. So when you, when you launched the company, was it, did you do direct to consumer and retail at the same time? How did you think about the distribution um, and that split when you got going? Yeah, um, direct to consumer with Shopify now is the easiest thing in the world. So, you know, you get a website developer for a few grand and, you know, away you go. Uh, so that's a very easy thing to stand up in today's world. Uh, so that's a given that, you know, you're going to do that right off the bat. And then depending on the type of product you have, you're going to get into Amazon and that type of stuff um, to amplify it. In beverages, direct to consumer never really is a big part of the overall business because of cost of shipping. It's cost of shipping, and it's just not a behavior to buy beverages consistently through, you know, and have them shipped online. 
more so in bigger cities where, you know, it's harder to, you know, drive and that kind of stuff. But mainstream, you know, throughout middle America, you know, they're driving to, to pick up their, their beverages. We started out and, you know, we started out with direct consumer from, from day one and the business was about a, I don't know, probably a 70, 30 split DTC to retail and it's flipped since then mm. and it continues it continues to, to widen towards the uh the retail you know part of that is because we're you know we're, we're currently on average we're adding about 700 new stores a month good lord what's the sales force like to make that happen um we currently have about 113 dsds um that we manage um we'll be taking that up to the goal is to get it up to 250 by the end of next year. DSD. Direct, direct store distributors. So these are independent contractors uh, that work to get our product and get it to the stores, merchandise the stores, you know, basically service the stores. They open new stores. They're kind of frontline sales people. They pitch the store on carrying the product and then mm -hmm. they keep the relationship and they're sort of like an account rep to... They do, yeah. It's, it's their relationship. They get the percentage of sales. What's the difference in margin between direct-to-consumer versus the retail environment? Our margin is is actually better for uh, retail than it is for direct-to-consumer because of the shipping. That's unusual, but we're also unusual in that we have all our own... We have an internal DSD system. We don't, we don't contract that out to a big company that has a bunch of DSDs underneath. We took the middleman out. We manage the DSDs ourselves. So let me see if I, let me see if I'm bridging the gap here. There are entities out there that basically have um, distribution sales reps that might already have relationships with all these locations, retail environments all over the country or world. And you can contract them to go do this mm -hmm. for you. And instead you say, right. Hey, We'll hire some managers internally and we'll just recruit and train the distribution sales reps. Is that the approach? Right. Right. And my thought there is, if you remember, we talked about what you brought up is that instead of having, you know, 20 things on the truck, in most cases, that's the only thing they have on the truck is off is us. <laughs> so they're giving us top priority. And fortunately, the product we have is, is one that the velocities enough that they can, you know, they can make a good living just off selling one product. Yeah, that's wild. Are there other angles that you're taking to grow right now? You mentioned a pretty wild acceleration, right? Two and a half million in the first full year, 30 plus million in the first second year or in the <clears> full <throat> second year. And uh, the trajectory continues. Um, is it just expanding um, direct to consumer and the retail channels. And are you changing how you do that at all as you accelerate past 30 million? Um, I would say that, uh, it's really just about scaling at this point. Um, I mean, the one thing that we are doing is, you know, we did three, uh, last year we did three university partnerships, uh, one with university of Southern California, one with university of Texas, one with Florida state university. We are the official tonic of their athletic departments. Um, and we have a plan to actually roll out 76 more of those next year. And if this is, I'm just kind of borrowing from the Red, uh, Red Bull playbook, kind of this college activation. Because what we saw is that when we did it at USC first is that, you know, when you know, Sally is going to school there. She, you know, she gets introduced to it. But then when she went home for the holidays, you know, she introduced it to her family, to her friends. And we saw an uptick in uh, uh, direct to consumer in places that we didn't have, you know, any store coverage. Mm. Uh, and when in talking to those people, they're like, yeah, you know, Sally came home. We tried this. We fell in love with it. And and ordered it online. So uh, there's a halo effect out around those schools. It's not just about the school. It's about it's about uh, networking marketing. That's very, very effective marketing when Sally comes home and, and does that because it's not us telling them it's good. It's what, you know, it's a family member or friend going, you got to try this. And the beginning of that is a center of influence like 
a university in this case. What is the profile of the person that you're trying to hire to execute that role for you? As far as the um, the university program, college activation, mm-hmm. um, the guy that we have leading that, that's really all he's ever done. I mean, he's done massive um, college activations, you know, thousands of, of ambassadors on campuses, and, you know, a lot of guerrilla, you know, uh, stuff, of, you know, walking around backpacks, passing them out in the, you know, library, going to the right Greek parties and having them there, you know, um, a lot of, you know, stuff behind the scenes that, you know, that most people don't think about. So somebody that's done literally what you want to have done. Yeah, it's it's basically hiring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of college kids to become ambassadors and preach you know, the benefits while they're there on campus. And I know that uh, somewhat similarly, you have sort of an influencer program online for the direct to consumer. Um, is that a big part of the marketing initiative? What I have found is that, you know, very early on, influencers were, had a pretty good ROI. They don't seem to have that much anymore. I think the public in general is, especially ones that, that hawk a lot of different products they've realized those are commercials Mm -hmm. and it's not real um in in a lot of cases so they don't you know they just kind of disengage when that comes you know comes up the piece that we have found is the most productive of any type of online marketing is is the podcast Mm. and the podcast have been incredibly successful how do you track that normally we'll have a discount code uh, well, well, not normally, always have a discount code and the, and the podcaster will announce the discount code and so that it, all the sales then are linked back to uh, the podcaster. Got it. I should probably get a discount code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should. Looks like I do have a promotion code. <laughs> Apparently they sent it to me before the interview and that code is BAM40, B-A-M-4-0. And it's actually the first time I'm ever officially quote unquote, promoting a product because I don't really care to promote other people's shit. But I actually am a huge fan of Feel Free. So the way that I ended up talking to JW in the first place is that they saw me talking about Feel Free on another podcast episode and they reached out and they said, hey, you should probably interview JW. If you're interested in checking out stuff that is an alcohol replacement or caffeine replacement, check out Feel Free. Promo code is BAM40. When I started this, I didn't even know what a podcast was. And I went on the first two or three of them. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I mean, this, the sales are just crazy. And I started thinking, you know, which, you know, we and we had tried different influencers of all different levels, you know, very high end ones, micro, mid, whatever. None of those really, you know, did a whole lot. But I think what it is, is if if someone is engaged enough or likes the podcast or enough that they're spending that much time listening to them. Mm hmm. Um, they don't feel like it's a commercial. They feel like it's someone trying to, you know, give me some real information and, and, or, you know, it's giving me interesting stories and, you know, or the combination of both. Um, because, of, and you also, it's a so much longer format that you really can explain something. You can give background, you can give, you know, it's not just about a little snippet about this. This is, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. It's about here's the story, the person, you know, that did this, why they did it, you know, the pitfalls, all that, you know, people like that. They respond to that. I would say that we're in the golden era of, of podcasting as far as a, a marketing tool. I think that's why you see so many, so many out there. Uh, I mean, wild, wild growth curve in that industry in general. In the that's last crazy. Years. Yeah. It really is. Um, It'll be well, interesting to see how that matures over time, you know, where that goes. But it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great, great business, great space. Lots of unknowns right now on that front. Um, and I know that we're uh, coming close to time here, but I want to. You mentioned something that I think is uh, highly relevant to entrepreneurs, and I want to make sure that I uh, close that loop at least somewhat. Y- you talked about your uh, story of sort of hitting, I don't think you used the words, but functionally a rock bottom with alcohol and Mm -hmm. other substances and uh, then not drinking for the last 12 years. Um, And that ultimately was the genesis uh, of 
feel free. Exactly. First, the the first question there is, uh, I you know I know tons of people that have varying struggles with uh, substances, and some of them identify it as significant. Some of them don't identify it as significant, which does not mean that it's not. <laughs> but right. Right. My question for you, first and foremost, is. Do you think that it was necessary for you to hit that rock bottom to make an adjustment? Do you think you would have done it without that? No, no. I think that um, in my case, um, I had been so successful and been able to control everything else in my life that I would have just continued to try to control it and it eventually would have killed me. I would have killed myself and or somebody else and life would be, you know, would be over. Okay, so the... Introduction to feel free. Um, how do you see that as a a parallel to alcohol in your world? How do you use it, um, and uh, how do you feel about it in terms of it being um, a problem or not in your world? Because it is also a mood adjusting change in substance. Most people, what I found, including myself, use it for two things: uh, caffeine replacement and alcohol replacement. Mm. So I use it you know, small amounts throughout the day. Um, earlier in the day for productivity enhancement before working out, before work, you know, during podcasts, whatever. In the evening, kind of to relax. Um, and that's what we see most people doing. You have two, two, you know, two main plants. One of them is uh, a social lubricant. The other plant is uh, productivity enhancement, endurance. And when you mix those together, you actually can get both. I call it a chilled energy. It's what you ultimately wind up with. Um, as far as uh, your question about, you know, the downside is, you know, unfortunately, just like anything else that alters your mood and makes you feel good, uh, you, it can be habit for me. And that doesn't matter if it's sugar or cheese or, you know, sex or whatever. I mean, it's, any of these things that done in excess can, can start causing physical and or social problems. I was mindful of that having come from that world and in the very early stages, because no one had mixed these plants together before. I purposely did, you know, abusive levels of them for a period of like three <laughs> or four months and check my blood chemistry versus my annual blood chemistry. And I didn't see, you know, elevation liver enzymes or anything like that, um, because I knew that some people would abuse it. I mean, that's just, you can't create something that makes you feel good that somebody's not going to, you know, abuse it. It's just, that's just life, unfortunately. When people ask that question, I'm like, that's not the question you should be asking, because that's a given. <laughs> what you should be asking is, if I use this on a regular basis, is it going to hurt me physically or socially? If used responsibly, we've not seen that, you know, we're serving over a million servings a month now, and we've not seen any evidence of that. And I know for myself personally, I was a binge drinker and, you know, I'd do fine for a while, but then, you know, I, I couldn't stop. Uh, I actually can moderate this. And this is the first substance that, you know, that I've personally been able to do that with. It's like this. Um, and we're hearing that from a, a lot of other people. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I'm sort of perpetually interested in habits and the mm -hmm. habits that we build and how they guide our, the outcomes down the road. And I, I look at many of them the same. I look at uh, the habit of coffee consumption or the habit of exercise or the habit of gratitude or the habit of hard work. Um, they're all things that uh, once you put them in motion, um, they sort of just happen. Uh, so mm -hmm. the more deliberate you can be about crafting those habits, uh, I think the sort of more satisfied you can be in life. No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, so I find it uh, fascinating to hear your story of going through this uh, project and then being connected to um, a new potentially habit forming substance, um, that serves as a replacement and uh, for a couple things for alcohol and caffeine in this case. And, and I, I agree with you. I think that there's kind of an interesting, um, chill energy to this particular substance. So I appreciate you making it. Yeah. I know for myself, you know, 
what I realized was that, and that's really why I poured all my focus and effort into finding this, was that if I didn't find something, I was going to go back to doing what I was doing before, eventually. And I knew where that would end. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I've got, I've got to fix this or find a solution because this is not going to end well. Uh, Cause I know myself, you know, well enough. And fortunately I, you know, I feel like now I've been consuming it on a regular basis for about four years. It works for me. I'm 60 years old now and I'm still, you know, able to, um, Really, you know, crush a good workout. I'm able to, you know, I wake up at four, four thirty every morning and I'm, you know, still working at, you know, six o'clock at night. And, and it's not like, a, you know, I'm fortunate in that I'm doing something I love doing, but, uh, I'm able to be, you know, very productive for, you know, um, a lot of hours every day. Yeah. That's great, man. Um, well, I appreciate you carving out time to talk about it. I think that there are, are both kind of interesting uh, lessons in that from a human perspective, an entrepreneurial perspective, and also um, tactical business. Uh, CPG yep. is a crazy thing to dive into, and uh, um, there are great lessons that you can pull into other other arenas of business as well. Well, hopefully, uh, you know somebody that's listening to this that uh, is potentially or is in it early in early stage or thinking about getting in it can use some of this to keep from making some of the you know mistakes that uh, a lot of uh, people getting into this industry can make yeah that's great man well if people want to find out more about jw ross specifically um or the product where do you want to send them uh our website is uh botanic tonics.com uh there's a lot of additional information there. Great. Well, thanks again for carving out time. You bet. Thank you. If you're interested in checking out stuff that is an alcohol replacement or caffeine replacement, check out Feel Free. Promo code is BAM40. Love it. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed doing it. I need your help. There are three places you can find Beyond a Million. The podcast itself, beyondamillion.com, which has some cool free resources, including a free course. And we finally launched the Beyond a Million YouTube channel. I would love it if you would go there and subscribe. And if you don't want to, you still would probably enjoy seeing the visual content. Check it out, youtube.com forward slash at Beyond a Million.